reading is 2 Samuel chapter 6 verses 1 through 19. You can find it on page 280 through 281 in the Old Testament. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which was called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ayo, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ayo went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there, because he put forth his hand to the ark, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry, because the Lord had broken forth upon Uzzah. And that place is now called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obedadam the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedadam the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obedadam and all his household. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obedadam and all that belonged to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedadam to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David danced before the Lord with all his might and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people departed, each to his house. God is still speaking, and we are still listening. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kathleen, for reading for us today. I was looking at the title of today's sermon and reflecting. That sounds, we've been taught, I think, that that sounds so ominous. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. But it's such a beautiful promise. I hope that we feel the joy in that and rejoice when we hear those words. Friends, will you be in the spirit of prayer with me? Oh, gracious and loving God. We are reminded this morning of the joy of knowing that your kingdom awaits us. The kinship between us all, O oh God, is waiting for your perfection. Living in hope of the promise that you offer. 
living in hope of the promise that you have ordained, O God. We give you our thanks and our gratitude this morning for your Holy Spirit among us each and every moment of our lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every heart be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I know we always have, our children are always a little less present during the summers. And I think with our return from COVID, they're even a little less present right now. So, um, so don't think we're skipping our children's time, but our children's time is prepared for our children. You know, adults get to listen in, but it's not really a message that is prepared for the adults. So do know we, we skip that intentionally, and we'll skip that, of course, on weeks when our children aren't here. Um, I have to do lament just a little, because the last several weeks I have crafted and prayed and created the best children's moments in the history of Christendom. <laughs> I might be exaggerating just a little bit, but um, amen. Well, friends, unlike most of the entire continent of Africa, Ethiopia was never colonized by Europeans. Now, during the great scramble for Africa of the 19th century, this is what we call the period when the European nations began in earnest to divide up Africa for their own interest, basically just to harvest the resources that were there. During this time, the Ethiopians, they successfully resisted the European invaders, the European occupiers. Now, Ethiopia and Liberia, which has its own history of connection to this country particularly, of course, they are unique in the whole continent of Africa that neither of those places were subjected to colonization. And Liberia is maybe a gray area in the way that it's founded, but... But Ethiopia actually holds another really unique distinction. Because when we tell the story of Christianity, we tend to focus from our own heritage, specifically our European history. We talk about the Romans, the Greeks, and the way Christianity worked its way into Northern Europe. And that sometimes leads us to kind of gloss over that some of our early church figures very important figures like Augustine and Athanasius, they were African. In the book of Acts, we learn the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Now this tells us in knowing this story that Christianity was present in Africa within 100 years of Jesus' earthly ministry. So very early. During this time, pagan faiths still dominated Northern Europe, from which many of us come in our lineages. Of course, we know in the year 330, Christianity was designated as the state religion of the Roman Empire. Now, this was 50 years, excuse me, in 330, Christianity was made legal. Prior to then, it had not been. And this was 50 years before another edict, the Edict of Thessalonica, that actually created Christianity as the official religion of the empire. Now, in the northern de deserts of Ethiopia, not too far away from the border of Eritrea, if you know your African geography, maybe a little more helpful, about 1,900 miles south of Cairo. There's a small little village called Axum. Now the priests of a small little church there, they claim to be the guardians of the Ark of the Covenant. And that's today, in 2021. The Ark of the Covenant, of course, being the, the vessel created by Moses to hold the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written. Now the ark, as we know, disappeared from history when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem, when the Babylonians destroyed the temple almost 600 years before Jesus was born. Now legend has it 
that the ark was taken to Ethiopia for safekeeping. And it has been there ever since. Now the Ark of the Covenant, we know, has inspired seekers for thousands of years. And it has a long, long history in our scriptures. After receiving the Ten Commandments, Moses is given specific instructions, very specific instructions, on how the Ark is to be built. And not only that, but how the Ark is to be handled. It is always supposed to be covered. And when it is moved, it's only supposed to be carried attached to two long poles. And the reason for this is because God's instructions were that the Ark of the Covenant was never to be touched by human hands. Now we know the Ark, it travels with God's people for 40 years in the wilderness. After they're freed from slavery in Egypt. The ark has marched around the city of Jericho for seven days as God's people await to move over the Jordan into the promised land. At one point, the ark is even captured by the Philistine armies. Of course, after several months of being captured by foreign armies, they return it to God's people because it had begun to cause so much calamity among them. Because it was not God's intent for it to be there. Now we can look at this as a metaphor of our relationship with God or we can think about it in a literal way. I'll leave that up to each of you this morning. As one of the gifts that we have in our denomination and in our church is our freedom of thought and the ways that we relate to our God. But what we do know, no matter how we approach this story, is that the Ark of the Covenant was central to the life of the people of God. Because inside it, it contained those Ten Commandments, those stone tablets. But do we remember the story of manna from heaven? I know our campers do this week. We talked about it at summer camp this week at Temple Hills. There's also manna from their wilderness experience that was inside the Ark. And there was the staff of Aaron, the brother of Moses. I almost think about it as a holy time capsule containing treasures for God's people. And for a time, it was even believed that the ark itself was the literal throne of God. And that the presence of God actually resided with the ark itself. But the ark goes out of fashion for a while. We don't hear about it much, and we learn that King Saul, the first king of Israel and Judah, the King Saul is very impatient. And he doesn't seek out the ark when he needs counsel. Of course, this might be another signal to us when we're reading the story that he's not really relying on God, that King Saul is following his own will. But when David becomes king, David reinvigorates the central place of the Ark of the Covenant in the life of the people of God. David, of course, was anointed king of a united kingdom. And David sought to create a new capital for God's people in Jerusalem. And as part of this new capital, David decides to transport the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. With a lot of fanfare, he does this. Now, 2 Samuel 6, of course, tells us that the procession that David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, with harps, with lyres, with timbrels, with cistrums and cymbals. It's a lot of stuff going on here. This was a really big deal. People were joyous at this event of moving the Ark of the Covenant to the new capital. And all these festivities, though, as we heard in our story, the scene turns pretty dark. Because as the ark is being moved, it's placed on a cart. Do you remember me saying the instructions earlier? Did we hear place the ark on a cart in those instructions? 
Okay, yeah, that wasn't rhetorical. <laughs> so we did, right? So it's as on this cart, the ark starts to rock, and it almost tumbles to the ground. It almost falls in the dirt. Now, but while helping move the ark, Uzzah, he's there. He's like, oh no, the ark's going to fall. I see it's unstable. It's rocking. It's going to hit the dirt. And he's probably panicking a little bit. This is a very, very important symbol, a very important container for God's people. And he didn't want the, the Ark of the Covenant to fall to the ground, as we wouldn't want our, any of our sacred relics, or I don't want to say relics, any of our sacred objects to fall to the ground. We wouldn't want to see our Bible fall to the ground, right? And on top of that, there's this large crowd that's around, right? So if it's going to fall to the ground, you know, a five-second rule where nobody's watching, you know? <laughs> but there's lots of people there. Everybody's going to see if it, if it falls. <laughs> and surely that would have put a damper on this celebration. So Uzzah, in his effort to prevent this fall and keep this celebration going, he reaches out his hand to the cart and he, he holds the Ark of the Covenant up a, to steady it to make sure it doesn't fall. But our Bible tells us that in that moment, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died beside the Ark of God. That's pretty harsh, right? And we heard that right. Uzzah's trying to stop this ark of the covenant from falling to the ground, but his mere touch, because it was part of God's instructions that human hands were not to touch the ark, God struck him down in that moment. And I think to our modern ears, at least to my modern ears, this sounds pretty harsh. It seems like somebody's trying to do the right thing here, and hey, and he was punished with death. So what are we to make of this? Was this warranted? Did Uzzah deserve death for trying to help the ark not fall to the ground? I know sometimes in modernity, particularly, we tend to look back on historical events and judge them with our own eyes in our own context. So I, but I can't answer that question whether or not that was a right and just thing. Not in my own mind, anyway, in our context or in the context of which they were living. But what I do know, and I can affirm, both then and now, is that we are the ones who rely on God for help. Not the other way around. But this story also has some other things that are going on in it, because it is dripping with King David's complicity. Because as the anointed king of Israel, as God's chosen ruler, David knew the rules of how the ark was to be handled and moved. and He knew all of this. Or at least he should have. Because God had made it clear when the ark that was moved, it was to be carried on the poles, not on a cart. God had made it clear that the ark was supposed to be covered. And of course, God had surely made it clear that the ark was not to be touched. So Uzzah may have done wrong, but I think David bears responsibility as well. Because David had kind of organized this event. Luther Nice of Luther Seminary, he suggests that the poor planning of kings, of leaders, the failure of our leaders often caused disastrous consequences to those of us with less power. So David, in his own efforts to exalt himself, in his own efforts to put on this grand public display of his own authority and this jubilant celebration to God, in his own efforts to really showcase that God was on his side, he sets up a situation in which an innocent good man trying to do the right thing, pays the price with his life. And of course, we see similar things in our world today. We see our leaders in Washington claim Jesus Christ as, as their sovereign while they refuse to do anything about rising health care costs or refusing to do anything to address poverty. Just a few years ago, we'll remember this, 
our leaders here in Cle Cleveland. We remember them going behind closed doors, doing backflips, rearranging budgets to find hundreds of millions of dollars in order to finance Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, while in the exact same moment refusing to address our city's homeless. And we've been witnesses, of course, to our religious leaders claiming the power of God in, in support of partisan political positions. Because we often think and we like to think that we can manage God. That we can manage God. And when we think about our God in that way, in doing that, we create God in our own image. We imagine that our God wants to keep us that our God wants to keep, say, for example, the non-white, non-English speaking Ford or out of our country, rather than listening to the words of Acts chapter 2, teaching us to share what we have. I don't want to gloss over that. I know these are very complex issues. But in all the things we look at in our life, from our partisan political positions to our, to our homeless problems, to our city's finances, we need to come first through our faith in Jesus Christ. And we imagine sometimes in the other way around, kind of in the same way that we imagine that we create God in our own image, so we do what's best for us and then think about God on the backside. Now, of course, since the time of Abraham, God's people, us and our ancestors, we've been taught to fear God. And most times, of course, when we see, say, you know, have a fear of God, it's a a reference to a reverent respect, to obedience, to submission. But I suggest that perhaps when we ponder how very far in this world we have strayed from God's dreams for us, that we should take God's fear at face value. Because we focus so much on God's grace and mercy, which is a right and good thing, that we can be tempted to overlook God's wrath and God's judgment. But like us, our God is very complex and encompasses all of these things. And perhaps when we look at the death of Uzzah, and especially when we look at David's arrogance, maybe we should not only fear God, but we should be terrified. And the New Testament is a follow-up to the story in Acts 2. We're taught to, to share what we have with others, of course. And we learn in this story that, of this couple, both Ananias and Sapphira, who had tried to pretend like they were sharing, but kind of hoarded some of their own resources to kind of keep back for themselves. And they have a pretty harsh judgment as well, because they're both struck dead for not sharing as well. They sell some property, of course, and instead of giving the money to the proceeds, they, they don't really trust what's going on. Now, while I think we can escape, or we cannot escape, of course, the knowledge that we will be held account to our actions. We are people who also know that our God is a God of forgiveness. Our God is a God who will help us get back on the path because our God is a God of second chances. And who among us does not need a second chance? If we were an amen church, I'd ask for an amen. <laughs> so and Jesus taught us, of course, during our faith, during his time here on earth, to repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And that is a right and a beautiful thing, a thing for us to be joyous about. Knowing that God is a God of a second chances. That we have the opportunity to repent to turn away from the actions that are harmful, to turn toward those things that are good. Because that word repent is packed with all of that. Because it's not just about asking for forgiveness, it's about having that change of mind, about turning away from the wrong and turning toward the holy. And we fear, I think, often of having a change that profound because that will upend our lives. That would change us. It would change the way we react to the world. Who likes change? Especially when we're comfortable, right? Because the world that we think of would be completely and totally 
just turned upside down if we took every single moment of our lives to follow the lessons of our faith. And I don't say that in guilt and judgment because all of us need that second chance. We try each and every day to get a little bit better. So my prayer for us, for all of us who are gathered here today, both near and far, is that instead of reaching out our hands to change the will of God to suit us, that instead of trying to make God in our own image, that we can live more fully into being created in the image of our God. That by God's grace we can repent and have a change of mind and a change of heart with joy, with happiness, and with gratitude because truly the kingdom of heaven is at hand, my friends. May it be so. Friends, in lieu of a, a hymn this morning, Doug Henderson is going to offer us a medley.